Hey guys, I'm back with my second episode of Q&A. Thanks so much to everybody who submitted questions on Instagram or Facebook, and I really hope to keep doing this regularly because you guys have so many great questions. You can ask anything from cello, baroque music, building your music career, or even just questions about me. So keep them coming. Um, feel free to leave them at the end of this post or chime in with some of your own answers to these questions. So let's dive right into the first question. How old were you when you started and did you love it from the start? Any tips on how to keep a young student motivated? So I don't have the most traditional background um, in playing the cello. I do think a lot of people start the way that I started. I just think that they don't typically end up as professionals. I started playing cello in the fourth grade in my public school orchestra program. So I didn't start with a private teacher or with private lessons, which is what a lot of students do who end up being more serious. In fact, I actually just continued playing in public school orchestra a few times a week with no private instruction at all, all the way through 10th grade. I actually struggled a little bit in the beginning in my group class in fourth grade. It didn't come to me super easily, and I think just the fact that I didn't have private instruction also made the learning process a little bit more slow. So I definitely recommend the most important thing in getting your child motivated from an early age is getting a private teacher who can really help sort of foster their curiosity and their interest in the cello and also help answer their questions and really give them the guidance they need to be able to play well. Although I didn't have private lessons at a young age, um, I think one of the reasons that I was able to stay interested in the cello was I never really had a ton of pressure around the cello. My parents weren't forcing me to practice or, you know, kind of jumping down my throat, making sure I was taking care of cello. I was allowed to be self-directed. While I do think it's important to give your kids a schedule and make sure that they're committed to their practice time, I think there's a very fine line between pushing too hard and actually sort of ruining their interest um, and still making sure that they are practicing and that they are keeping up with their lessons. Obviously the private teacher is going to do a lot to shape their practice habits and also the way that they approach the instrument, which is why it's just so important to have a good private teacher. It really is important to practice in the beginning, but I don't think it's more important than keeping interest and love for the instrument. So even if it means that your child can only get in five or 10 minutes of practice in a day, I think it's better to do that than push them too hard and run the risk of them just hating it altogether. As they get older, you know, middle school, high school, I do think that the commitment and the time spent should increase. Um, but especially when they're younger, I think it's important that they just stay passionate and interested in their instrument and that it doesn't become an additional homework assignment for them. Do you get nervous while performing? What are your tips for being comfortable for playing for others, especially other cellists? Unfortunately, uh, I completely sympathize with this. I also really don't like playing for other cellists. It's very stressful. And when I say other cellists, I mean the masterclass setting where you're typically playing for a room full of your colleagues, your cello playing colleagues. I think it's a different dynamic when you play one-on-one -on -one for another cellist because there's a little bit more of a supportive environment there. But um, it is true, it's very nerve wracking to play um, for a classroom of your classmates. I've had to do this all throughout my academic career, and also when I attend Baroque festivals, there's usually a cello class, um, so I've had to do it in that context as well, and I wholeheartedly agree it's the most stressful situation you can be in. That being said, my one word of encouragement is it's not really a real-life professional scenario that you're ever going to find yourself in again. It is a purely academic scenario when you're there playing for a room full of cellists. Um, there may be some rare exceptions where you have to do that, but in general, when you're performing a concert, you're not going to be performing to a bunch of cellists. So do bear in mind that this is a difficult thing that we have to do when we're in an academic setting, but you're not going to have to do it forever necessarily. So you just want to kind of do your best to navigate a situation like this. I think one of the things that help me the most is that when the situation is reversed, when I'm, for example, in that same masterclass in the audience setting, to try to be as supportive, as open, um, as helpful with my feedback for the people that are playing so that I feel I set up the dynamic for the others to do the same for me when I'm in that scenario. I can kind of help set the tone of the room with my own actions when I'm not the one performing. There's a lot of pressure, um, you know, feeling like other cellists are going to be picking apart your technique. And they probably are, but that's not so much about you as it is about them thinking about themselves, thinking about building their cello technique. So don't take it too personally because any cellist in your seat is going to be analyzed a little bit in that way because of the nature of the situation you're in. 
Really everything uh, gets easier with practice and repetition. Um, so as much as you can play for other people, um, that's just gonna help get you a little more comfortable in that environment. The first few times you do it are gonna be really scary, but as you do it over and over again, you maybe have some good experiences, some not as good experiences, you just get kind of more under your belt and you feel a little bit more at ease with the situation. I really recommend finding a cello friend at school or wherever and playing for them and asking them for feedback, just getting used to someone who is gonna look at your technique that way and analyze it a little bit and just get comfortable with the idea that, okay, this person also plays my instrument, they're gonna have you know specific feedback for me relevant to that and that's okay, I'm open to that kind of feedback and it can be really incredibly helpful too. So take a deep breath, understand that if people are judging your technique, they're doing that more because they're focused on improving themselves and that we're all here to support each other as cellists and do your best to really show all your colleagues that that's your attitude. Okay, getting into some Baroque specific questions. Are all Baroque instruments old or can you buy new ones? So not all Baroque instruments or what we call Baroque instruments are actually old period instruments from the time period. My cello, for example, was actually built a modern cello in the 1950s and then about 20, 30 years later was converted into a Baroque setup. A lot of the surviving Baroque instruments have since been turned into modern instruments with new bridges, necks, and fingerboards anyway. So it's very rare to even find a Baroque instrument that's still in the proper Baroque setup. So even if you have an instrument from 1710, it's possible that, you know, in the 20th century it was converted modern and now you've converted it back to a Baroque instrument. So it's really hard to actually find a true period instrument, though there are of course some out there. There's definitely no shame in using a modern built instrument that is then converted into a Baroque setup. And you can do those conversions, um, changing the bridge, changing up the strings is something you can do yourself, shortening the fingerboard, getting a simpler tailpiece, etc. Um, a good instrument maker can do these adjustments for you and you can do them a little bit at a time. You don't have to feel like your entire instrument needs to be converted to a Baroque setup up right away. Really just getting your hands on a Baroque bow um, and some gut strings can go a long way on your modern instrument. And bows especially are something that are typically built new. They're just built in the style of an 18th century bow. So you're not going to see um, actual period instruments quite as much as you're going to see modern replicas of period instruments. But the idea is just to get the basic setup there and then you're using essentially the same tools that they were using in the Baroque period. Do you have any tips on making intonation adjustments when performing with accompaniment? Playing an equal temperament with a piano versus playing with only strings in just intonation. So intonation, tuning, temperaments, huge topic in early music. And I think especially as continual players, uh, we have to deal with this so much as fretless continual players because for example, if I'm playing continuo on the cello and I am playing also with a harpsichord who is playing continuo, um, we are playing the same bass line. The only difference is that the harpsichord's right hand is gonna fill in some chords and harmony, which means however the harpsichord is tuned, whatever temperament it's in, I have to actually match every pitch that the harpsichord makes because they are playing my exact part in the left hand. So it's really important if you are playing uh, with a harpsichord or even a lute or any instrument with fixed pitches that's going to be playing chords that you have an understanding of the temperament that you're in and just what it sounds like in the keys that you're playing. A lot of times after hearing my harpsichordist just play a little bit um, in the key so I can hear how their temperament is tuned, I'll ask to play a scale with the harpsichord player in unison just so that I can find my intervals, find the spacing of my left hand, um, and just really hear where all the notes are put. Also, sometimes given the circumstances, your harpsichord might not be fully in tune. And that's a really important thing to know also because you don't wanna be matching your harpsichord if there is actually a note that's out of tune on the instrument that the harpsichordist isn't equipped to fix right then. I think when you're playing with a harpsichord or another fixed pitch instrument, you're just a little bit more locked in. You really have to be listening and adjusting to the harpsichord at all times. Whereas when you're playing with maybe just a string ensemble and you can tune to each other, you have a little bit more flexibility. In those situations, when you're just playing with strings, you typically just wanna tune from the bottom up um, and then really make sure that the middle voices, people playing the thirds, that those are truly pure and that you find you know, an intonation that you're happy with. This is something that we deal with all the time in my string quartet because we don't have any instrument with fixed pitches. So we're constantly working on intonation, playing chords and scales together so that we have a collective idea of how we want our tuning to sound. 
I honestly dread the times that I have to play an equal temperament because my muscle memory at this point is so used to playing things tempered. So if I ever do have to play with the piano, it's usually a pretty big adjustment to me, but I think anytime we're playing on a fretless string instrument, we have to have flexibility in our left hand uh, to adjust certain notes for intonation and just really have our ears open so that we can make those adjustments quickly. Are you protective of your cello getting scratched? How do you care for your instrument in terms of humidity? I'm not the most protective of my instrument. Um, I probably should be more protective. Um, I'm a little clumsy as a person and I'm not too stressed out about cosmetic issues on my instrument. So little bumps or scratches on my cello don't really upset me. I of course do my best to avoid them, um, but if they don't affect the sound and quality and co real condition of the instrument, I usually don't worry about it that much. But I am very, very strict about humidity control for my cello um, for a lot of different reasons. One, living in Boston, the winters especially are incredibly dry. Indoor heat can really destroy um, an older instrument. And then just dry winter combined with heat, it really makes for a bad situation um, for instruments. Other than open seams and instrument problems that can result from a lack of humidity, the gut strings also sound really bad when they're too dry, so it's really in my best interest to keep my instrument humidified all throughout the winter. I have a good room humidifier that I use in the room where I keep my cello. I make a point to keep my cello as far away from radiators and heat sources as possible in the winter, and also just in general not crank my heat in the room where my cello is. Whenever I take it outside or anywhere, I do put dampets in the case, which are a pretty simple invention that most cellists use, um, and they definitely come in handy, but a room humidifier is essential um, for the winter times here in Boston. When my strings get really bad and dried out, I'll sometimes use a little bit of olive oil just to kind of get some moisture um, back in the string, and that can help temporarily to make the sound better. But my instrument specifically um, is a little bit fragile down near the bottom and those seams open up really easily. Um, almost every winter I have to go and have my instrument repair guy re-glue my seams down at the bottom of my cello and near the tailpiece. And that's frustrating, it makes my cello sound a lot worse, it's of course cost money. So I really do my best to keep it humidified all winter long so I can avoid those trips to getting the seams re-glued. Would you ever consider playing the viola da gamba or other Baroque instruments? So I do play a little bit of viola da gamba. I absolutely love the instrument. Um, I got to learn it a bit. Um, my first time learning it was at a summer festival um, in a little beginner gamba class. And then I got to play it a little bit more seriously in grad school when there was an instrument there being lent for me. I played it for both continuo and also viol consort music. Um, learned a little bit of clef reading because anyone who plays the viola da gamba knows you have to be able to read bass, treble, and alto clef which is not the easiest thing to do on an instrument that's not your first instrument, um, but it was a really great experience for me and I just love playing the instrument. Right now I don't have an instrument in my possession. Uh, if I get into a situation where I can borrow one again, I would love to be recording some gamba music. I can't play really virtuosic solo music on gamba at this point, but I would love to play, you know, little smaller, shorter pieces on the gamba and record them for the channel eventually. So that will happen when I can get my hands on a viola da gamba. If you don't know much about the viola da gamba, um, it's sort of the predecessor to the cello. It has six or seven strings and also frets. Um, the range is similar to the cello, but the timbre of the sound I think is pretty different. And the repertoire is wildly different because um, it spans earlier than the cello and was also very popular in France. So there's lots of French music for it, um, ensemble music for all different sizes of viola da gamba. So it has a really rich history and a lot of stuff that the cello does not have, um, which is why it's a nice instrument to double on if you do play the cello. Thanks so much to everybody for submitting your questions. If I didn't get to your question this time, um, don't hesitate to follow up with that question. Next time I'm doing a q and A, I I wanna just continue to answer these for you guys and keep expanding the information that I provide for you here on the channel. So thanks for watching. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe as I do new videos every week. And if you'd like to help support these videos, you can become my patron on Patreon.